Okay. Mm, so welcome everybody. Hi. Happy Friday. I was just saying as everybody was trickling in that it feels very Friday-ish. So I'm glad to have some of your time today. This Friday Focus for Health is hosted by the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services Quality Innovation Network, Quality Improvement Organization for North and South Dakota. My name is Carolyn Tufty, and I'm a Quality Improvement Advisor for the Great Plains Quinn. And again, thank you for joining us today. Um, before we begin, a few housekeeping items to review, and I know you guys heard this um, at the noon session, but if you're new to us at 1230, today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted within one to two business days on our website at greatplainsquin.org. We will have an office hours format during this webinar for questions and peer sharing amongst organizations. Um, you can also add questions into the chat and we will address those as we can. We have added a resource handout that you can access. This resource handout includes all resources shared during today's session and the previous three sessions on adverse drug events. So today, when talking about adverse drug events, we're going to look at how care coordination can help in preventing an adverse drug event. We will look at some billing options available for you in your care coordination efforts, and we will touch base on the last two components of the PDSA cycle, the study and act portions. As a QIO, our work is driven towards, but never limited to those 65 years and older. With that in mind, it is always worth mentioning the four M's framework, mobility, what matters, medication, and mentation. Patients aged 65 years or older are at a greater risk of an adverse drug event. As Carrie Sorensen reminded us last week, anticoagulants, blood thinners, such as warfarin, anti-diabetic agents like insulin, and opioid analgesics account for approximately 60% of ED visits for adverse drug events. So where did we leave off last week? And let's talk about how we can tie it all together with care coordination to prevent ADEs. I'm hoping by now you've built your team, you began collecting and analyzing data and to find a problem to begin working on. And if you haven't done these things, that's okay. It's never too late to start. However, just for our curiosity, we're going to ask this question again, just as we have the previous weeks. Um, mostly because we like to see how you guys are progressing through your own PDSA cycles. So the question is, what phase of the PDSA cycle are you on? Are you in the planning phase where you have identified a process improvement project and assembled your team and began looking at data? Are you in the do phase? Have you started testing your change and comparing that data to what you predicted? Are you in the study phase? where you're looking at your results, trying to decide if a, if a positive improvement resulted or and what corrections need to be made? Are you in the ACT phase? Based on what you learned from the test or the do phase, are you making a plan for your next step? Or are you unsure? If you would please answer the poll that Dee launched or type it into the chat, we would appreciate that. And again, if you haven't started, that's okay. By the end of this series, you will have plenty of ideas on where to start. Let's see here. Okay, well, Carolyn, we do see that we've got 29% of people in the plan, 14 in the study, and 57% are unsure. That's awesome. Which phase they are in. That is awesome. Well, for those of you who are unsure, that either tells me you're working on something and you're just not sure where you're falling or you're not sure what topic to decide on and hopefully in the next 15 minutes you have lots of ideas. We'll go to the next slide D. So care coordination. When you begin to define care coordination, there are multiple ways to define this function, all of which are similar yet slightly different. For our purposes, we're taking the definition from the Institute of Medicine's Priority Areas for National Actions definition. 
And they define it as the extent to which patient care services are coordinated across people, functions, activities, and sites over time so as to maximize the value of service delivered to patients. Even more simply put, organizing patient health care needs to achieve a safer and more effective care. There are two ways of achieving coordinated care through broad approaches and specific care coordination activities. Here are some examples of broad care coordination. Now, none of this information is particularly new to the healthcare field. However, this is meant to be more of a guide of things care coordination can entail. I should also add that not everything on this slide needs to be implemented at one time. Start with one, make it part of your practice or your habits and go on to the next. I won't read every word of this slide to you, but I would like you to know that this is where you can get ideas and suggestions for quality improvement idea projects. Teamwork and patient-centered medical home are closely related and would be good starting places for both an implementation of a care coordination process or review of your current care coordination efforts. Medication management includes proper medication reconciliation at all transitions of care. Transitions of care include clinic visits, outpatient procedures, ER visits, hospital admissions, observation stays, or any time a patient enters your facility for review of a condition or problem, or any time a patient transfers level of services within your facility. This is also where you could apply the 4Ms framework we have mentioned throughout this series. Care management can include, but is not limited to follow-up phone calls and connecting patients to community resources. Follow-up phone calls have traditionally been performed following a hospital discharge, but if your facility is already doing this, I challenge you to expand these calls to other departments. Other considerations for follow-up phone calls could be after ER visits, ER patients who left without being seen, patients who no-showed a clinic appointment, patients who didn't keep referral appointments, patients who didn't keep same-day surgery appointments, you could further narrow that down by payer type in each category. Really, the possibilities are endless. If you are new to performing follow-up phone calls, I would suggest calls following an observation, acute care, or swing bed stay is the best place to start. Health information technology used to its full potential also aids in care coordination. Whichever platform you use, it's imperative to use it to its full potential. Ultimately, this should save you time in performing care coordination duties and help identify problems with patients before they occur. Now, with all of that being said, we understand that your time isn't free, and we also understand that coordinating care takes a lot of time. So Medicare does offer reimbursement for some of these services mentioned. We have provided the links to the Medicare Learning Network's resources for these common billable care management services. They include chronic care management, transitional care management, the Medicare preventative services, and co the collaborative care model. This in, in and of itself could be a QI project for your facility if it's something you do not currently bill for. And as always, I would encourage you to reach out to someone at the Great Plains Quinn if needing assistance in rolling these out. So lastly, the PDSA cycle. Last week, we provided some helpful tips on implementing the plan and do portions of the PDSA cycle. And let's just briefly talk about the last two parts. Study, the third phase of the PDSA cycle. In the study phase, you would analyze the results and compare them to your predictions. If possible, the analysis of your data should be completed as a team. You should then compare the data you collected to your prediction, summarize and reflect on what you've learned. This can also be considered the debriefing part of the PDSA cycle. You would also decide whether the change led to improvement or not. Act, 
The fourth phase. Based on what you learned from the test or the due phase of the PDSA cycle, you make a plan for your next step. Those next steps can include adapt, make modifications and run another test, adopt, you decided that the test you made improved, made improvements within your facility, and we're gonna expand it to a larger scale, or abandon because it didn't work the way you thought and it wasn't, make, it wasn't resulting in quality improvement. So just to wrap all of this together for us, we're gonna play a short recording taken from a podcast. In this podcast, you will hear Dr. Steve Tremaine talk about how you can use the medication reconciliation process in a PDSA cycle to improve patient outcomes. Now, implementation tips. Firm believer in small test of change, rapid cycle, plan, do, study, act. Let me tell you how we did it. We identified one eight bed tele unit and one physician and one nurse who were willing to play with us and do some trials. We did not roll it out to a unit. We did not roll it out to the hospital. We started on a Monday morning with whoever was the next patient admitted to that unit. The doc and the nurse decided they would go do a medication reconciliation session with the patient when they were admitted to the floor. They introduced themselves. They told the patient they were trying something new to try to get the medication right. The, nurse, the patient sort of chuckled and said, well, that's a good idea. And they went through the process and they did it on paper first. No point of re redesigning the, e the EMR if we're gonna have to redesign it every day. So as we do these trials, so they did it on paper. And they went through the patient's list. They got the home med list, including the over-the-counters. And they decided what they were going to continue, discontinue, and modify. They explained to the patient. It was all visible on a piece of paper. And that piece of paper went into the medical record. And they huddled afterwards. So this took a few minutes. And then they huddled. And they, just, they, they discussed with the patient as part of the huddle what worked, what didn't work, and how they might do it differently. Well, they hadn't quite hit it, you know? You don't design things right the first time. So the next day, they did it again on the first patient admitted that day. They did it again on the third day as they were getting closer to getting the form right and the process right. On the third day, what I would say, the first miracle happened. Another doctor walked up to them and said, what are you guys doing? And they explained what they were doing. And she said, I'd like to try that too. So they had passively recruited a new test pilot to their team. And so now two doctors and two nurses were trying this. And now we could speed up the process a little bit. By the end of two weeks, they had done six small tests of change throughout that unit. And they said, we think it's good enough to go. The great French philosopher Vol Voltaire reminds us that perfect is the enemy of good enough. And they decided it was good enough. So they spent one month rolling it out to the entire that entire eight bed unit to make sure they had it right. They did not want to roll it out to the rest of the hospital until they knew they had really got all the bugs out of it. Well, by about three weeks, they decided they had it. And so they kind of advanced their rollout schedule. And then they sent it to a 32 bed uh, inpatient medical unit. Okay, this is going to be a challenge. These are the patients with the most complicated medications. Let's see what happens. Well, they did it there for a month and they really had to make no changes, no changes whatsoever. Then they rolled it out to a surgery unit and the same thing happened. Before they could actually roll it out to that surgery unit, the second miracle happened. The nurses on the, on the surgery unit said, we want to do this medical re reconciliation process. We heard it's really good and it'll help us out. And I stopped and thought, when in my life have I ever heard staff at a hospital desire change that's occurring in one unit to be accelerated to their unit so they could do it sooner? That was miracle number two. So it rolled out to that unit and lo and behold, there were no changes in the process that had to be made then. When we got to the pediatric unit, we did need to make a change. They did need to be able to record the weight of the patient because so many of the pediatric doses are weight-based. And then we got to the OB unit. The OBs didn't really think of iron and vitamins as medications, even though we tried to convince them they were. 
Uh, rather than fight with them, we just redesigned our forms for them to pre-populate the forms with iron and vitamin. And for some reason, the patients weren't taking those on admissions. They could just scratch them out. And that's how we did it. Admission, um, this uh, medication reconciliation all the way through. Before we even started doing discharge medication reconciliation, we saved transfers for, for the last phase of that project. A note about transfers. Thank you for playing that, D. I just really appreciate how he uses the example on how you start with your planning, you do, you study, you go back to planning, you do, you study, you go back to planning, you do, you study. And the act comes when you start rolling it out on a larger scale. And he just does a good job of explaining that. He also does a really good job of explaining how you start small. You don't have to do your entire facility or even your entire department. One provider, one day, one list of patients, one nurse is enough to get the ball rolling. So, I'll bet overwhelming, making intentional efforts at care coordination can not only aid in preventing adverse drug events, but these efforts will also result in less ED visits and hospital readmissions for your patients and your facilities. Here's a list of the resource and tools that will be available to you on our resource handout. And before we leave, with all of this information, I just want to provide you one more thing before we wrap up this Friday Focus for Health on adverse drug events. These are two resources care coordinators, nurses, providers, family members, whoever are welcome to use to help connect patients with resources they might need. South Dakota uses 211 or the Helpline Center, and this site houses an array of resources someone might need. And some of our own staff in North Dakota has partnered with FirstLink and university students across the state in an effort to canvas small towns and rural communities to help beef up resources within the FirstLink database. So here are two great resources in each state for you to use should you need them. I thank you for listening in with me today. And Dee, I'm gonna turn it over to you for the office hours portion. Hey, well, thank you, Carolyn, and that was, very, very good information. Um, I just hope that people that are implementing something take the um, wisdom of start small, one step at a time, and uh, you try to bite off a whole entire system-wide thing and it gets frustrating and it, it probably will be set up to fail. So just small little increments of change is gonna lead to the best um, the best outcomes. So, all right. So during the office hours today, um, I have a couple of polls that I'd like to um, get your input on. And one of them is, if you are using a care management model, has it helped to reduce adverse drug events? And it's just a simple yes, no. So if you could, Put your answer into that. And we will start viewing our results here. So if you are using a care management model, has it helped reduce ADEs? And if we don't get any responses, we'll assume that there isn't anyone using a care management model. We'll give it about 15 more seconds here to see if we get a yes or no. Of course, if you can't see the, the polls, they are in the chat section. All right, so we have two responses and we have two no's. My thought is um, that you, you are not using a care management model. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch the second poll, which asks, um, if you're billing, but I don't think we need to launch that because nobody answered yes. So I was going to bill one that or bill. I was going to um, launch one that said, are you billing for your care management? Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch it. Somebody might have been occupied during the other one and couldn't answer. So if you know that your organization is billing for care management, 
mark yes. And those of you who don't have care management as something that formal in your organization, you can go ahead and mark no. So we've got one response and one no. Okay, two responses, two no's. Okay. And then I'm just, I'm gonna launch a word cloud and it says if you aren't billing why, but let's change that to, um, I'm gonna edit that poll real quick and it, and if you, let's just say if you aren't using care management, why? All right, so this is a word cloud. So what you need to do is put one to two words in the response. And you can put anything you want in there. Didn't know, uh, too much time, time, staff, red tape. Um, ah, okay, that's a good one, a large ad. Yes, it would be. It would be a large ad. Um, we've got a need training. I'm going to add that into our word cloud here that came in through the chat. Okay, so we've got a large ad, need training, lack of staff. These are not surprising uh, responses. I think it's something that we're seeing nationwide, especially in small uh, practices, rural areas where there isn't a, a plethora of staff and staff are all wear, already wearing many, many hats. Um, the other thing is it, a lot of people, they are they are doing it. They just haven't put a formal name to it. So, all right. Well, I think we'll close that one up. You guys are in luck, and is it April? We're going to have a whole series on yeah. care management. So exactly. That's just what I was going to, yeah, yeah. I learn was, all you need about it. Yep. I was just going to say we're going to have in April, one of the topics will be for the Friday Focus for Health will be chronic care management. And then in March, before that series starts, we're going to have a LAN event, a Learning and Action Network webinar event. And... Um, it is going to give an overview of chronic care management, what it entails, and then the uh, Friday Focus for Health will then pick up after that webinar with some detailed um, strategies and ways to get it up and running. All right, does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask about content that they heard today or in the previous three um, sessions? Today is going to bring this series to an end. Next Friday, we start a new series, which the 12 to 1231 is reducing avoidable hospital emergency department visits. And then um, 1230 to 1 Central Time will be blood pressure control. And the link will be put into chat for how to register for these. February series. <clears throat> well, we're, we're hoping that that um, a lot of these series doing one um, project improvement is going to help with lots of these different topics. So avoiding, you know, reducing avoidable hospital emergency department visits can definitely be um, helped with working on adverse drug events because a lot of times um, that adverse drug event leads to an ER admission. So you're going to kill two birds with one stone if you're working on on something. You now, I, I am a diabetes educator, so my mind always goes to the hypoglycemia and how it just, you know, when I first started 20 years ago doing diabetes, everybody it seemed like that got a low blood sugar just automatically went to the ER. 
And I think we've done a lot of good work with education about how to treat low blood sugars, whether those happen in the home or whether they happen in um, a senior living environment, assisted living, long-term care, um, skilled. I think we've come a long way in getting uh, policies, procedures, protocols, standing orders in place so, so people can avoid that ER visit. So, um, you know, it, it, all, it all wraps up into one for better patient outcomes, for better quality measure outcomes for the facility and organization you work for. So that's what's... Is, um, sorry to interrupt, Dee. I was just yeah. going to say that as Carolyn was talking about um, different ideas for um, care transitions and, and the follow-up phone calls, you know, just implementing calling patients after discharge really has shown to decrease those follow-up emergency department visits. So you're right, it all can just tie together one way together. or another. Yeah, for sure, Carrie. I can't tell you how many post-discharge calls I made and and throughout the course of that conversation in those first two days following discharge, it was determined, oh, I don't think you can wait two, two weeks to come back. You better come back like today mm -hmm. into the clinic and not in the ER in four days and right yeah communication and staying in touch is just vital yeah all right well we always like to know how we did and what we can do better how we can better um tailor these fridays focus for health to meet your needs so there's the QR code that you can scan to let us know and fill out the evaluation or the link to the evaluation will be in the chat. Um, Kelsey has already put in the fr uh, February Friday Focus for Health series, so you can click on that and register if those two topics interest you. We hope everyone will join. All right. Before we go, any questions, any concerns? Anybody want to come off mute or put something in the chat if you have something you'd like to mention? We always love stories. They can be success stories. They can be challenges and barriers that you overcame to make a success story. Um, Kelsey's put the link into chat there for the um, form that you can fill out to submit a success story. We always love to hear those. We think it's important that peers share their success stories amongst each other. And that's why we ask for them because, you know, one organization can be struggling with something and another organization found a way to overcome that. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's share. Healthcare is hard enough. We need to share all of the good things that everyone comes up with so that we can have the best patient outcomes that we can have. And this is Carrie. I'm our communications director. And if you are willing to share a best practice, a resource, a success story, or a, a, something you've learned along your way, we will make that process and sharing your story really easy for you. I promise. Um, if you just give us uh, the start, we'll have some questions prepared for you and do the legwork on that. Thanks, Carrie. All right. Well, I have that it's one o'clock. So to be um, cognizant of everybody's time, we'll end for today. But we hope we see all of you next Friday as we begin the second uh, month of our Friday's Focus for Health topics. Everyone have a great weekend and hopefully we'll see you all next week. Same time, same place. Thank you. Thank you guys. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thanks.